Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Ellie. And thanks to all of you for being here. So, God has really good timing. That's what I want to share with you tonight. God has really good timing. And that's because he's sovereign, which means he knows everything. He, he's outside of time. He's beyond time. He knows the end from the beginning. And he causes and chooses and allows all kinds of things, everything throughout just human existence, God has ordained to happen. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you because God, he also orchestrated the most significant event of all time as we see it recorded in Galatians chapter four. There's a verse for you there. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So when the fullness of time had come, that means at the right time, at just the right time, God chose to do this thing. God shaped and saw the events of history that were transpiring He witnessed the pain that humanity endured as a result of their sinful condition. He watched all this take place and he was performing miracles and doing works in the midst of all this. And in a certain, as time marched onward, at a certain moment, God said, there, right there. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. He chose to do that at a particular point at the right time. He has great timing. Christmas is about God sending his son, Jesus. That's what it's about. And so why did he send him? John 17, three holds an answer for us. It says, and this is Jesus. He's praying to God in this moment. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so, two things. Because Jesus was sent in the first place, we get to know God. And second, by knowing God, we experience eternal life. God sent Jesus on our behalf at the right time. And so I want to share with you three realities that we experience through Christmas, through this season that we're kind of celebrating. And there's a lot of, you know, things going on and excitement and festivity. And there's also, of course, a deep meaningfulness underneath it. And something I want to uncover from this passage from Galatians chapter four. The first reality I want to explore is redemption from captivity, redemption from captivity. Because in that verse, in that passage, it says that he came, he was sent to redeem those who were under the law. And it also says that you are no longer a slave, no longer a slave, redemption from captivity. See, the Old Testament records the history of the nation of Israel. And an important facet of their history is the fact that they were slaves in Egypt for a long time. They were slaves as recorded in a book called Exodus. And they were in need of someone to free them from their bondage. And so what did God do? God, this Israel's cho- God's chosen people. And so he decided to send a mediator to rescue the people and bring them to himself. And that mediator's name was Moses, right? I'm giving you a lot of history here. Leviticus 26, 13, God reflects on this as he, he led them out of Egypt. He rescued them from that through Moses. And he says this, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt 
so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. So this is God's recollection and just sort of renewal of our understanding that this is something that he did. This is historical. (laughs) And so to fast forward a bit, when Jesus came, there were two types of people. There were Jews and there were Gentiles, right? So the Jews were ethnic and religious followers of God. They were the descendants of the Israelites who God had rescued out of slavery, out of Egypt. And the Gentiles were all the other people who who were in the world, who remained outside of God's blessing. And so both of these groups, however, the Jews, they were enslaved to something. They were enslaved to the law, which was not capable of saving them. And the Gentiles at this time, they were enslaved to their own flesh. They didn't know one thing or another about what it meant to follow God. And, and the same is true today, by the way. There are some of us who are seeking, yearning, trying to find a way to earn our salvation in order to be reconciled to God by just doing enough good things, enough good, enough rituals that are maybe going to get us to God and enable us to experience salvation. And then there are some of us who we're just trying to enjoy life on our own terms and according to our own desires. But neither of these paths can possibly lead to salvation or satisfaction. And so just like the people in Jesus' day, we're, we're stuck. We're enslaved to these forces that naturally surround us. But God sent a mediator to rescue us and to bring us to himself. And that mediator's name was Jesus. And so through Jesus, God broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. Okay, that is good news that we get to experience beyond just the historical account of Exodus and Leviticus and all these different things that happened in the Old Testament. This truth of going from slavery to redemption is true of us if we, if we give our lives to Jesus, if we trust him as our savior. Now, to redeem something means to buy it back, to buy back, okay? So God bought us back through Jesus' sacrifice. Thereby, this, this is something significant. That breathes a new sense of worth into you. Does that make sense? You were so worth it to God, that he sent Jesus to be crucified, to be sacrificed as as the, the penalty for our sin and as the payment on our behalf so that we could experience life with God. And so this deep, immeasurable price that he paid was for you. And that makes you incredibly worthwhile, (laughs) worth it. That fills your life with, with meaning and worth. And so if you walk with God, you are not only free, but you have immeasurable worth. And this should enable you to walk with your head held high or confident, right? Because of the price that he paid for you. There is boldness and confidence in understanding that apart from myself, apart from any merit that I could, could drum up to save myself or to walk boldly and confidently, God pours his worth into me by redeeming me. And he does the same for you. He offers the same to you if you have not yet committed your life to him. But that redemption is available and that redeems you from the, the things that hold you in captivity, whether it is trying to earn your way to God or trying to just find some other meaning through desire, through your flesh. And so this is, that's the first reality that we experience through Christmas, redemption from our captivity. The second is adoption, adoption into a family. 
Do you guys know what adoption is? This means somebody or a family taking in somebody who doesn't have a family and, and bringing them into their own, right? And it says, so that we might receive adoption as sons, back in Galatians chapter four. So that he, God sent Jesus in order to what? Redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And so you've been redeemed, but that's not all. You've been redeemed, but that's not all. Then he redeemed you so that you could become his son or daughter. And so this gives us some special things in our lives. Uh, I can think of a few here. One is identity. When you're, when you're adopted into a family, you're given a new identity of sorts, right? Perhaps you would take on the surname of that family and you have a new association. You have a new identity as a member of that family and not a part of any other family or clan or whatever. And what that means is that you and I are no longer held back by the shame of who we once were. Having a new association and new identity means that we are no longer held back by the shame of who you once were. I don't know about you, but there are things that I, that I was before I knew Christ, before I gave my life to him. My identity was in fleeting things. It was in shameful things. And it's in, it was in things that couldn't, couldn't help me, couldn't save me. And so, but God has given me a new identity, a new association with him as a part of his family. And he does, does the same for you. He also fills us with purpose. Being a part of God's family, being adopted into his family means that we're given new purpose. See, you have a crucial role to play as a member of the family of God. And in Ephesians 2.10, it says, we are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He already laid it out, said, all right, I want this person to do this. I want this person to do this. In a family, people have different roles that they play and th- different elements that they contribute to that dynamic, to that, to that group. And we have a purpose you and I have a role to play if we would accept it. If we would continue to follow what God wants for you, both as a, as a general member of his family, we all have certain roles that, that we all partake in. And there's also a unique role that he has designed for you. You are God's workmanship. And along with a new identity, a new purpose, we also, through adoption, experience intimacy with God. We experience intimacy with God where he's our father. And we can call on him. There's actually a verse here, verse 6 of Galatians 4, where it talks about that since we are sons of God, he sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And it says, he sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. And this word Abba is an Aramaic word, which Jesus used to to refer to God the Father. And he referred to him in this, it's a very intimate way of addressing this father figure. And so God, once we become a son or daughter, once you become a son or daughter, you experience the spirit in you crying out to God, Abba, Father, you are my father. And just in, in running to him in an in a almost childlike way, experiencing the intimacy with God that he has designed for you to experience with him. And that means being connected with him. That means getting to know him deeply. And that's what he wants to experience with you. Intimacy with God, along with purpose and identity. And then third, the third reality is reception of an inheritance. Reception of an inheritance. We receive this inheritance as God's children. And, and so in that verse, verse seven of our key passage, it says an heir through God. You are an heir through God. What is an heir? It is somebody who receives an inheritance. That's such an interesting kind of illustration. It clearly indicates that that heir has no necessary merit or qualifications 
that, that they, they bring to the table that earns them that inheritance, right? This is something that just on account of, hey, you're part of the family. You get this inheritance. You're the heir to this whatever, abundance, this blessing, this inheritance. And that's, that speaks directly to our position where we don't, we don't earn this. This is something that God bestows on us as his child, as his adopted child. And so in Hebrews 11, it talks about the situation, a situation with a man named Abraham. He was also in the Old Testament. And he, it has this to share about Abraham's life. It plays out in a helpful way to understand this inheritance. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And so this idea of Abraham's land inheritance, God, God called out Abraham from among all the people that were around at that time, a long time ago. Abraham's land inheritance was a picture of our experience. Living temporarily in a foreign land, as in a foreign land, right? We're here and we're not, nothing is, no, nothing is fully complete yet as we are here on earth, but we're living temporarily as in a foreign land, looking forward to what God has for us in this life and in more, most especially in the next. And so just like Abraham, we are looking forward to the city that has foundations. We're currently just living in tents. We're just trying to make do with what we got. We're living in a foreign land spiritually. And God is, wait, we're just waiting for God to bring us home to that inheritance. And then in Romans 8, 17, it says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. What this tells me is that life isn't perfect yet, right? Even if you are a follower of Jesus, even if you are redeemed, adopted, have an inheritance waiting for you. It's not all perfect yet. Not, all, never, not everything is easy in your experience, in your life. And in fact, some things are incredibly difficult. We experience suffering. And it says right here, yeah, we share in his sufferings. As followers of Jesus living in a fallen world, we share in his sufferings. But why? Why do we do that? It says, in order that we may also share in his glory. That glory is the inheritance that waits for us. We get to share in his glory as we endure the trials that we are forced to, to deal with in this life, on this side of heaven. There is a present pain that you and I have to go through that prepares us for, that helps us yearn for even, a future glory a present pain for a future glory. And in Titus 3, 7, it simply says, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. And that word hope, that, that helps. This really shows me just, this is such a kind of Christmassy kind of word, right? We talk about this word hope in regards to this season that we're in, of Christmas, and we're celebrating the hope that was symbolized through Jesus being sent, coming down from heaven and being sent to us so that he can save us, so he can redeem us. So we have hope for the future as a result of that. And then as we await that day, as we await that inheritance, which is to come, that heavenly inheritance, in the meantime, we have, we have access to God and we have access to his power and his love. And in my study Bible, as I was reading about these different things, it said this, he who is justified by faith in Christ is no longer a slave, but a son, right? And it says, with full rights as an heir to God's infinite resources. Full rights as an heir to God's infinite resources. 
So God has infinite resources available to his children. And even though things are not going to be all great and some things are going to be really difficult right now, God has the resources and the blessings in store for you, ready to to pour out if you'd ask him, if you would call upon him, if you would seek him with all your heart. He wants to bless you, and he wants to fuel you for the things that are going to test you. And that act, we have access to that power, that love. And so, I'm wrapping up soon, but Act 17 says this. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has appointed their, has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God. And perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God has really good timing. He has orchestrated history in such a way that as to send Jesus at the right moment, according to his will, changing the world, causing events that ripple throughout history up to now. And in right now, he has appointed the moment and the place for you to exist and to respond to these three realities of Christmas. I encourage you to embrace these realities. Let them propel you toward knowing God more and making him known. In John 20, verse 21, this isn't in your handout. John 20, verse 21 says, this is, Jesus is talking to his disciples toward almost at the very end of his time on earth. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. When the fullness of time had come, Jesus sent forth you, his disciple. God has appointed your access to his gospel and your proximity to those who don't know him. So I just want to kind of get you thinking with this. Who is God sending you toward? Who in your life needs to experience the redemption, the adoption, the inheritance that you've been given, you've been given access to, and you've perhaps taken a hold of and reached out to God? And so who is God sending you toward and what greater gift is there? Let me pray for us. Father, we are thankful. We are thankful for your power on display and your sovereignty on display through the miraculous birth of your son. Thank you for sending Jesus. We we want to use this opportunity, take this opportunity to worship you and glorify you as a result of this, this price he paid, as a result of this great gift that we've been given, Lord. So keep that truth on our minds as we move into this season with family, with friends. I pray that you would keep our eyes open to opportunities to know you better and to to share with people the riches of your, your grace and your goodness, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.